All right, everybody, it's about a quarter to four, or so oh, I won't tear the podium up. I'll just get started. Um, so this is user experience for online education, putting UX to the test. Uh, just out of curiosity, how many, uh, for how many people here is, is this your first DrupalCon? Wow, that's awesome. OK, well, welcome. That's so great to see so many new people here. It really shows how the community is growing. It's awesome. All right. So that's me. My name is Becky Gessler, and I've been involved with the Drupal world for uh, four or five-ish years, like, I guess around when Drupal 5 was coming out. Um, I used to do kind of independent web consulting, Drupal web development, that kind of stuff. Um, I worked for Google for a little bit, mostly on the search team, but also had a little bit of, uh, of exposure to user experience projects there. And most recently, I worked for a company called University Now, which is the, the ed tech piece of the talk today that we'll, we'll talk a lot about. That's me making coffee in my office with cats. I'm really happy that DrupalCon is in Portland this year. Um, a lot of really good coffee being roasted out here. So that's really great for me. Oh, and um, about these slides, they're, on, like, uh, they're inside of a Google Doc, so it, it'll be you know, open for everyone to look, and I'll show the bit.ly link at the end. And that's my Twitter handle and all that stuff. Okay, so here's what I want to talk about today. First, um, I really want to kind of give you guys an idea of what it's like to be doing user experience um, for online education. I mean, very specifically for, for within my company, University Now, what the unique challenges are that we face. Uh, I'm going to talk about a couple of different, I guess, recurring themes, lessons, kind of things that has been pounded over and over again to, into my head um, from, from doing work with you now. Um, and I also want to share with you guys a, a couple, like very three maybe, uh, tools that I've kind of used a bit and found really useful. Okay, so let's get started um, about university now. It's really important that I get this out uh, so that way you kind of everyone understands where, where I'm coming from. So the mission of our company is to ensure that high quality post-secondary higher education, well, that was kind of repeating myself. To, basically, it's to ensure that high quality post-secondary education is available to people everywhere. So this means basically that a college degree is within reach of everyone that wants it. So it's a very mission-driven organization, um, and we operate these two universities, uh, we own them. One of them is called New Charter University. It's 100% online, offers like associates, bachelors, MBA degrees. The other one is called Patton University. Uh, that one has a campus in Oakland, California, and also does uh, online degree programs. So that's sort of the structure of the organization. So has anyone ever heard of any of these guys up here on the slide? OK, a couple hands. Cool, so this is sort of the world of ed tech um, that you might read about in the New York Times every day or any other you know, news technology kind of website. Um, and what these guys are doing is, is really cool. Um, anyone familiar with the acronym MOOC? Kind of cringe when I say it, but MOOC, yeah. So MOOC stands for um, Massively Open Online Course. And what places like Coursera, Udacity, Udemy, edX, what they're doing is essentially taking this really high quality, amazing course material, packaging it up from some of the best universities around the world, or just from, the, from the, some of the best content authors, and kind of making it available and accessible to people. Um, and it's really awesome. I've taken some Coursera classes, uh, really great thing that they're doing. And so where does University Now, uh, my company, where do we fit into this ed tech thing? So we, we kind of sort of fit, that's what I like to say. I mean, we, we certainly embody the combination of technology and education. However, we're really different from the other guys because we actually own and operate two real universities um, in the sense that you can go to one of our schools and get a full degree program or you know, get a degree. Um, engagement for us and success is incredibly important. So Daphne Kohler, who's the, I guess, founder of Coursera, actually came to our offices and we had a nice conversation with her. And I asked her, I said, hey, what is the role of Coursera in keeping people engaged, keeping your students engaged? And, and I thought her an answer was really, really interesting. She said, you know, we're making that information available for people everywhere and that's 
That's the point. Like, we don't care if they complete the course all the way to the end. The point is that it's out there, and for the people that want to do it to the end, they can. For the people that want to just access it, it's available to them. So for us, in terms of student retention, which is something very important to any university, um, keeping our students engaged and coming back and completing courses is absolutely critical to what we're doing. So that's sort of a, from a design standpoint, that's a very big difference for university now. Okay, but online university, right? Like I'm sure you know some of you guys are familiar with, with these names up here. Online universities are not a brand new concept. This is not some, something we invented. Um, there are many working adults that pursue higher education online, and these are some of the institutions they attend. But our schools are even, you know, okay, we're fine. We're not the whole ed tech thing exactly, but we're also not the whole online university thing exactly. And so here are some of the reasons why we're not like them. Um, and, I'm, and I'm going through these to, to give you guys an understanding of the, the cognitive sort of overload this presents to our users um, when they try and start to understand what exactly it is that our schools offer. So to begin with, our coursework is self-paced. You can go as fast or as slow as you want as a student. You know, if you have something going on one week, you don't really need to do anything. If you don't want to, you can come back the next week and work harder. We don't have any financial aid or any government based loans, so you pay out of pocket to go to school. Um, the school is incredibly affordable. We have a monthly or an annual tuition, so we don't, do the, we don't do financial aid. Classes start every Monday, so whenever you want to go to classes, really, whenever you want to begin school is up to you. Um, we have this thing called the disaggregated faculty model, which is just essentially means the person grading your exam is not the same person that's coaching you through the course material, and that's also not the same person who's kind of advising you throughout your degree process, um, which is unique to many schools. And also we're something that's called competency-based, um, which essentially means that we are really focused on that you actually know the material, not exactly how you learned it. So if you come in already having a lot of knowledge about a subject, you could theoretically test your way out of a class. So for all of these reasons, um, I kind of want to move a little bit, but I'm afraid to with this microphone. Um, so for all of those reasons and for many others that I didn't talk about, we basically have created tons of mismatched expectations for our users, for our students, for prospective students when they come to explore our school websites and try and wrap their heads around what it is that new charter or patent offers them. So this is an example of some of the quotes that um, in user interviews I'll oftentimes hear with prospective students. Stuff like, well, when do classes start? Because university classes always start at a certain date, right? There's a semester, but well, at new charter classes start every Monday. Um, and they say sometimes, wow, this is really expensive. And so we're talking like for a bachelor's degree, like $200 a month. But the idea is that if you're used to this, if this model of paying later, where you're taking out loans and you're not worrying about it until after you graduate with thousands of dollars of student loan debt, having to pay $200 right now seems like a lot of money. It's a totally different model. You know, when's my final? Well, you schedule your final whenever you'd like and take it at home in your pajamas. I mean, it's kind of new. Um, you don't have to take it in your pajamas, but you can. Uh, it's proctored via a webcam, but it's, you know, we're not going to judge your clothes or anything. Um, okay, the question's like, how long does the course last? Well, with the competency-based stuff, if you already know the majority of the course, you might be able to just test your way out of it. You know, how will they grade me? The whole thing's online, and we, the person that's coaching you through your course doesn't grade your stuff. So these are all a lot of, like, these are some of the things that we hear routinely from prospective students, from new students even, um, and as user experience people, uh, it's very much our job to kind of fix this, or at least to deliberately try and help people understand what it is that, that makes us different and, and how our model works. Um, and so I kind of think of design as sort of this layer between what our users want to achieve, which is being successful and getting a college degree, um, and the actual work and doing it. So yeah, I've, I've been with university now for, 
I guess about about a year and a half, and it's it's a hard problem, and I've I've seen some stuff, um, some stuff that's worked well, some stuff that hasn't worked well, um, but as a user experience person, it's been a really wonderful opportunity to kind of think about problems that do not that are not my own. Like I'm, our team is very consciously designing for people that are not like ourselves. And that's a very, um, you know, UX thing. Like don't design for yourself, design for others, um, or rather design for your user. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been a very, it's been an adventure. Okay, so these are the three things I wanna talk about um, as kind of items that I've learned sort of time and time again um, from, from working at, at UNOW and doing user experience work. Um, so we're gonna drill into each of these. The first one is just about the importance of talking with people, even when they're not considered your target customer or your target user. Um, the second one is sort of stressing the importance of quantitative analytics and quantitative usability results. And the last one um, is about the word customer and the word user and why they're really kind of the same, yet they have different homes inside organizations which is weird. Okay, so talking to people. This is the first website that um, our school, New Charter, launched with. Um, it launched right after I joined the organization. Um, and one of the things I was scratching my head over was like, have we shown this to people before we're just going off and making this website? I mean, it looks nice and everything, but have we shown it to anyone? And no, we hadn't really shown it to many people. Okay. so. I was scrambling. I'm like, oh my god, we got to show this to as many people as we can. But like right before launch, I, I think I was there maybe a week before it's supposed to launch. Um, and so I just went around talking to as many people as I possibly could, like the crazy gorilla UX type stuff. You know, like, can, can you give me five minutes to look at this, please? What do you think this is? Like that kind of stuff. Um, and a lot of the feedback I got was like, uh, I I don't know, what, what is this? Like, I mean, and I'm talking about asking questions like, what kind of a website is this? What can you do here? You know, like, how would you proceed if you wanted to find out more? Very basic, vague questions, just to try and pick apart what is it that people are getting from, from me here. And what I found is that people were like, no idea. Oftentimes, it, like, the initial thing was that this is not a school, it's a bank, or a financial services thing. Um, when people finally got it, it was a school. It was very quickly dismissed. Oh, this is some University of Phoenix type school. They're going to take my money. But I was like, oh, okay. Very not the right impressions we were trying to get. And when I brought this back to my team, um, at that time, the feedback was kind of like, well, these aren't our target users. These are not our real customers. Um, and, and really, we, went, we ended up going down this path of, of weeks and weeks and weeks before it was sort of formally acknowledged, yeah, we're doing something really different, and we need to take our time to better explain what it is that, that makes us as a school unique. Um, and really, I guess I'm using this as an example because, yeah, like there are some things that, of course, are very specific to the, to the customer that you're trying to sell to, but there's some general kind of do people understand what we're trying to do um, that you should feel confident going out and getting some feedback on and bringing it back to your team? Um, because, you know, even if you're not the user, like even if this person you're talking to is not your exact user, you should be able to at least get across some, some very broad things to them. So that's one point about, you know, not feeling married to talking only to target users. Because as a startup, target users are, can be very hard to find and very costly as well um, to recruit and schedule and stuff for interviews. So another thing about not always having access or working with target customers um, is the idea of kind of using the 10 usability heuristics that Jacob Nielsen uh, wrote about a while ago. Jacob Nielsen is a god of usability um, with the Nielsen Norman group. They do conferences and write books and stuff, very insightful findings and articles. Um, and so this is linked to at the end of my presentation, but the idea of the heuristics are that basically this is like a list of 10 things that in most all cases, make for a better user experience. Um, 
We're talking about these kind of things, like, oh, do people know where they're at? Do they know how to go back to where they came from? Do they understand what is currently happening happening in the interim of them doing an action? And so performing usability studies, task-based usability studies, where you're just sitting with someone and asking them to do a thing and observing them, it will very clearly give you feedback about these kind of just interface level interactions. Um, and you can almost consider this as sort of objectively, does the design we've created allow our user, allow a user to, to meet their goal? Um, so just in this discussion of, well, we can't always find like the 33 year old single mother working two jobs, you know, well, okay, fine, but this, super tech savvy web developer couldn't even find our tuition page. So it's like, you know, those types of things, getting that type of data um, can be very useful to broaden your discussion. Okay, so this is a piece of raw meat and a bunch of different numbers. And I put them next to each other because I think that numbers by themselves are really cold and don't, or like not really that appetizing. Um, I mean, beef tartare, like steak tartare, whatever, it's pretty good, not gonna lie. But I mean, just like by themselves, without any context, without any story, without any appeal to pathos, you know, numbers kind of fall short, kind of lame. But, I feel like I'm going back and forth here. Um, numbers don't usually lie. You can tell data points in a way that sort of construes them towards a certain point of view. But I think, one thing I've really seen is that I do a lot of qualitative usability testing. Like I talk to people, I listen, I write quotes down, I get really nice quotes that I put on slides and in presentations and it's like, wow, people say, oh my God, that's a really great quote. It really summarizes what our users are feeling. Yeah, but having numbers to sort of back up what percentage of users feel that or what percentage of users took an action can be really helpful in distributing the results of the usability work that you do throughout the rest of your organization. Um, these are three tools that we use at different points at university now, Optimizely for A-B testing, Mixpanel for sort of, um, I guess, granul granularly measuring actions that users are taking on pages, as well as Google Analytics, of course. Um, and now, I think it's unreasonable to say, well, all usability you know, people and researchers and designers should understand analytics and go out and be measuring stuff that way. I mean, you can't do everything, right? But at the same time, if you can align yourself with someone in your organization that has data and cares about data and knows how to work with it, it'll make what you're doing all the more powerful and allow it to kind of seep into to people that may not be interested in fluff, which unfortunately is sometimes how qualitative feedback is, is looked at. Um, so it's not rocket science, but I just think as a user experience, like a, as a community, it would be helpful, I think, for, for all of us to take some responsibility for actually working with, with people that work with data. Okay, here's the, the last point in the thing I've learned section, um, which is that, I, and I believe this very strongly, that your customer is your user. There are many different, well, depending on how big your organization is, but oftentimes there's different parts of an organization that touch a customer or a user at different points in the life cycle of their involvement with your organization. For us, this is something like the person that's chatting with them on the website, the person that answers the phone in the enrollment center if they call in, the person that is responding to their technical issue, all the way to their student advisor, their instructor. Um, these are pe people that do different jobs but all touch, you know, our students. And then you even have me, who is sitting there in the, in, you know, in the office in San Francisco calling you up in, in New York, you meaning our student, and having a conversation with you. Um, and I'm learning things about you but so is everyone else along the entire you know, chain there. And at least in my experience, I have seen that when these groups of people do not communicate properly, or at least as frequently as they should, very different kind of ideas and expectations of, our, of, of who our students are form pretty readily. And it creates a lot of problems because it turns out that the marketing team is actually, uh, they actually have their own set of personas than the UX team. Um, and they're not the same people at all. And, and we're like, so we're selling to these people, but we're designing for these people, and it just doesn't make sense. 
So this is a this whole thing is a quote from from an article that also is cited at the end from this website, 52 Weeks of UX. And I love this idea um, that user experience is really just good marketing. It's about knowing who your market is, knowing what is important to them, knowing why it's important to them, and designing accordingly. So I started off at UNOW as a user experience designer, and I was working pretty exclusively inside our actual learning management system, the actual course platform that, that students interact with. As it became more and more obvious to me through the usability research I was doing with our actual school websites that we, we just were not explaining ourselves properly, I started getting more and more involved with that world. And so at this point, like I'm, I'm the lead of our UX team, but I'm doing a crap load of marketing. I'm doing a lot of like, how do we display something on a website that helps people understand how online courses work. It's a totally different like departmental type world, but at the same time, it is so fundamentally a part of the role of a user experience designer, of, of an information architect, um, helping you know your, your, your customers understand what you're all about. So if you guys have any marketing related people, oh wait, that's the next slide. Right, so, <laughs> you know, if you have any marketing related people that you work with or in general people that are out like a sales team interfacing with customers, go out and talk to them, say hi to them, maybe work with them, maybe just sit in with them at lunch or something like that. Um, and, I, and I think that type of collaboration is really what allows companies to have a more holistic vision of who their users are and better design and market to them all at the same time. And another argument, taking this even one step further, would be to say that, this is like my Google hat now, would be saying that SEO, like search engine optimization, is also really just about good user experience and about creating semantically appropriate metadata-rich websites. And I, and I, I really do think that's true. Um, so broaden the, I'm even further diluting what UX is, right? Okay. So, um, any questions on that stuff so far? We can we can like do that at the end too. But What's just the thing with your cat? what is the thing with I, just me personally? Yeah. You know, that's a good question. I just love cats. I love every kind of cat. Yeah, I do. I was semi quoting a YouTube video right now, but. I don't know if anyone else is the eHarmony one. Um, but yeah, no, I just, I have, I have four cats in New York and I'm in California now. I don't have them with me anymore. So it's like uh, sad. My parents have them. Yeah. Um, I had a question about, you said the customer is the user. Yeah. So you're mostly doing user testing with students. Do you do any user testing with the teachers, the faculty? Yeah, that's a great question. So the question was about if we do any user testing with uh, faculty in addition to students. So unfortunately, we do not do enough. Um, I think it's very known that the faculty have their own experience and set of tools that they use, and they are not as well sort of maintained as the student-facing ones. But it's a very, you know, that's like a very good thing to highlight that you know, your user is not necessarily just your student. What we do do is talk to students as well as prospective students, people that have kind of considered our school or in that decision process, so, yeah. Okay, so let's go on to the small bag of tricks section. Um, I love today at the keynote, mental models, right? And I was like, wow, she's totally saying exactly what I wanted to talk about today. So thank you, Karen, that was awesome. Um, yes, yeah, so we're gonna talk about that a little bit. Also, paper prototyping. And last but not least, creating a continuous feedback uh, mechanism, which kind of gets into how we actually talk to people. So here's um, Jacob Nielsen again, same picture. Um, and this is his kind of definition of what a mental model is. And, you know, this morning was, was great, like I said, that, that it was talked about. And it's really important here to think about a mental model not as how someone, not as how a thing actually works, but really as how someone imagines it to work. And the fact of how it actually works is kind of irrelevant, right? Like, it really only matters what... How, how this user experiences the thing to work. What they think happens when they will do an action or when they do an action. 
So, okay, we're going to talk about why this is important. So this is a screenshot of a course dashboard inside one of our courses. Um, a lot going on there. So I'm going to zoom in to a portion of the dashboard called the readiness meter. Okay, that's this right here. There's, there's multiple readiness meters, actually. Um, so the idea, the original idea of the readiness meter was that it would be a way for students to be aware of how far they've come in a course and sort of help them understand how much longer they have to go before being able to schedule their final. Because at our schools, you actually schedule your final exam when, you know, when you're sort of ready, when you've, when you've hit a threshold. So the readiness meter was both a measure of progress, like how much you have actually done um, in terms of how many practice quizzes have you taken? Have you taken your initial assessment? Like those types of things, but also a predictor, oops, a predictor of how far you have to go. That was the original intent. So in some of the original um, interviews I was doing with, with our first set of new students, feedback was overwhelmingly positive. It's like, oh my God, I like watching the green bar go up. The green bar, it's so great. I, you know, I, it always lets me know where I am. I like watching my progress. It helps me feel like I'm, I'm getting ahead. Um, and so this was great feedback, right? Um, I didn't really ever ask, what is the readiness meter? Or like, what is it telling you? It's just, this is my error. Kind of just asking what people thought about it, what, you know, how they experienced it, what, what was their favorite part of the, of the platform, and this is something that would frequently come up. A couple months later, it was like, readiness meter. <laughs> like, people, students were really not happy with the readiness meter. They were really pretty pissed off. These were some of the, the pissed off quotes. They weren't necessarily all in caps. I'm kind of just playing it up. But it was like, oh, it doesn't get greener. I just, I'm looking at, I'm reading things, and it doesn't get greener. Or I go to Internet Explorer, and it's here, and I go in Chrome, and it's there. I've just, I've given up. We've had students like on the verge of leaving the university over the readiness meter. And student, it just, it makes no sense, okay? Like when I, when I read 20 pages, it goes nowhere, and I take one quiz, it goes up there. So just like total infuriation. And I really sympathize with them because being an online student, if anyone has, has taken any online courses, it is really, really hard. It is very difficult work. And if you, are trying to trust in this little metric idea of like, oh, I have a readiness meter, and it doesn't do things when you're putting in all that work. Like, imagine what that feels like. So really what it came down to is that our, our students didn't, ha didn't really know at all how the readiness meter worked. They just, sometimes it went green. And in the beginning, it would go green more frequently. And, and we had this formula around it where, you know, based on the activities you did and how well you did on them, the thing would go up. And it was overall the logic on it, like the idea was good, but the logic wasn't well implemented. And so our students thought that, well, every time I do an action, the thing will go up. But in reality, every time you read something, it you never got any readiness. Like if you read 20 pages and spent four hours, your readiness just wouldn't go up. Like it just wasn't built that way. And we did also have browser compatibility issues. That was the whole browser thing. Um, but it was this idea like I could trust in this signal to tell me where I am in my course, how far I am away from graduating. We actually, like the readiness meter was bubbled all the way up to how far you have to go in your degree program. So it became this core metric that users had placed trust in and just, didn't deliver because it, you know, it, it wasn't just about progress. It was about different ratios of how, how well they had done on things and really a measurement of more uh, assessments rather than readiness. So this is also from um, Nielsen's article about, well, okay, what do you do when you become aware of mental models? How do you fix problems related to them? One option is to make the system conform, which basically means, okay, if users think that when they do actions, the thing will go up, we, we change it so it does that. We meet what their expectations are. The other option here, what Nielsen would say, is improve users' mental models. Um, I, I don't know if improve is the right word, but I think, or maybe just taken out of context, it sounds weird, but really what he's getting at here is the idea of educating users and showing them 
how your interface is supposed to work and kind of giving them contextual clues along the way of this is you know, how the feature works. So these are generally the two kind of paths forward when you have a mismatched mental model situation. So um, what a number of my colleagues are working on right now is completely changing how readiness works. Um, and my current understanding of, of how that's gonna happen is that we're, we're kind of doing away with readiness because the concept just falls short of what users expect. They expect that when they do a thing, it goes green and they can feel good about it. So we're really kind of moving towards a model that's about progress, about track your progress, not your readiness. We're not gonna tell you your readiness, we're gonna tell you how far you've come. We might also break that out, have readiness be a separate metric, but really that bar is gonna become about progress. We're kind of meeting users where, where they're at, where they're thinking about it. At the same time, um, this is something that has been added to the platform, where we've got this nice little hover tool tip. When you hover over the readiness meter, it actually tells you this is how that thing fills up. So this is kind of the idea of contextually helping users along the way to understand how your model works. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about paper prototyping, which is a really nice way of getting feedback from users um, in person. So the idea is, you know, if you're doing a traditional usability study, uh, task-based in front of a computer, you know, you have someone sitting next to you and you're saying, find out how much this course, you know, would cost you to take. And then you kind of just sit there and you watch them do it. You basically are giving them things to do. Contact a student advisor and kind of see how they go about doing the task. But, you know, on the screen you need to have something designed or at least you need to have something on the screen. Um, with paper prototyping, it's great because you can essentially just draw with pen and paper or you can make something up in fireworks, whatever, and print it out, cut it up, and do a usability study based off that. So this is an example of... Um, this is actually inside of a PDF, but so this is an oh god sorry this <laughs> this is an example of a um, mock-up that we made um, to illustrate an early prototype of explaining how do courses work online courses at our university, and what we did was we brought in I think four people and we printed this thing out and we cut up all the little boxes, and it was basically this large container element with no with empty. And we gave them the, pu the puzzle pieces. And we were like, how do you think this would fit in here? Like, how does this make sense to you? And we just kind of watched them arrange it. Sometimes they didn't even arrange it linear, uh, what is this called? Vertical. They arranged it like horizontally or diagonally, all these different directions. Um, and it was kind of this very fluid way of getting inside of the user's head. And it was paper and the actual tangibleness of it that allowed us to do that. Um, we also were able to iterate really quickly because of that. We found out this page is only half of what the original design was. And we realized very quickly this is like information overload. We, can't, we cannot put this all on one page. So we ended up just cutting the page in half and kind of splitting up the usability study for the following users, um, which ended up being really successful for us. So why does paper prototyping rock? Um, well, because it's really fast and it's cheap. Um, you can make changes on the fly, like I said, and, and granted, that was like that was a legit mock-up done in, in, in Fireworks, but you could do this with pen and paper as well. Um, and the other nice thing about it is not involving any development resources. Um, so I did a presentation at the Bay Area Drupal Camp in 2012 about prototyping, and I'll link to that at the end of this slide because um, I also talk about click-through prototypes in HTML. There's many cool ways of getting feedback, but I think paper prototyping is, is really great because pretty much anyone can, can do it. The other thing about paper prototyping um, is that what it allows you to do is get a larger group of people inside of a room um, witnessing usability you know, in practice and actually kind of being a part of that at an early level. Oftentimes, sort of the key stakeholder person will not get involved in you know, a project inside of, from the usability standpoint until the end. And then they're like, well, you know, we actually, this feature you know, doesn't make business sense for us to build it. So we can't even 
you know, have it in the place you, you're thinking of. So what paper prototyping does is it's since it feels so low fidelity, since it feels so generative and like we're all working together kind of thing, it encourages people to kind of come in and speak up and be there at the early part of, of the process. Um, and so I find it to be a very successful method for introducing non-usability people to the world of usability and to how fast and, and iterative it can be. Okay, so the last point I wanna talk about here is continuous engagement um, and how to kind of foster that inside your organization. So for us as a school, it's sort of just, you know, like I was saying in the beginning, we, we have students who are invested in our schools because they are trying to get a full degree from us. Um, but when I first started working at University Now, that didn't, I didn't really get that. I kind of felt the entire time like, well, why would they want to talk to me if I'm going to just say, hey, I'll give you 20 bucks if you talk with me for 30 minutes. Like, why would they be invested in doing that? But if you're solving a problem for someone with whatever it is you're building, a website, a product, you know, an app, like wh whatever it is, if you're solving something, I'm pretty sure you, know, you will have some users that will intrinsically be motivated to make that product better. If you're solving something, people wanna help you solve it because it's a real problem. And I was very heartened to see that there are tons of students that we have that wanna go out of their way to help us con continue to make the experience that they have better. So this is an example email that I received from Coursera actually uh, yesterday maybe. If anyone else is a part of Coursera, you probably also got this email. So I'm like making this presentation, I'm like, oh look at that. Um, and so this is just an example of how Coursera is trying to reach out to its super huge student base um, and kind of ask, like, hey, can you, you know, tell us what you're thinking kind of thing. So on our scale, this is an example email that I would used to be sending out pretty frequently to a uh, group of students who at one point or another had sort of opted in to the idea of being contacted. It was this very vague thing that kind of popped up on the bottom and said, hey, would you be interested in talking about your new charter experience, yes or no? So they'd say, anyone that said yes, I would hear about it. And I'd send them this really kind of simple, somewhat personal email, um, like, hey, first name, like, you know, I'd love to talk with you about how your experience is going. Would you be interested? Compensating, um, I highly recommend. People have lots of things going on and time is valuable. Um, so depending on how long you're asking to speak with them, you know, the amount makes sense. Um, but yeah, there's actually a sentence in there which is sounds kind of stupid. It says something like you're not dreaming or something. Oftentimes when I would send these emails out, the response I got was like, is this real? Is this really the school contacting me and you really want to talk with me and hear what I'm saying? I, I find that people oftentimes are really kind of happy to be given a place to, to air their feedback and talk with you about it. So doing small things like this to kind of Talk, like get engaged with your users oftentimes can, can be successful for you. So this is another example of a way that um, at our school we, we try and solicit feedback from our students. Um, this is a service called User Voice, which um, is one service among a bunch of others like Zendesk that we kind of have on, on our dashboard. It says site suggestions. Um, students click on that and it's a way for them to sort of post ideas, share, you know, other people's ideas and kind of have a discussion about it. Um, and so this is another sort of more background um, channel that we have that allows us to get feedback from users. And, you know, user voice is, is just one service. There's tons of others. Um, and really having sort of continuous feedback cycles where sometimes we're hitting people before they enroll, right when they enroll, a little bit down the line, after their first semester, and kind of keeping tabs on that. It, it helps to, you know, give you a better perspective, insight into the life cycle of, of, you know, your users, and also just make them feel more invested. Is that a question? Yeah, do you allow people to vote in user voice when they're voting on that? Um, I, yeah, let me see. 
like, I was zooming in with my eyes to the uh, screenshot. And yeah, it, you can see it says like 47 votes, number of comments. So that's actually a really nice thing about it because it makes, it gives students an opportunity to kind of vote on things within themselves and, and comment. So we do have that as well. And oftentimes really, maybe not in user voice, I think it might be more in Zendesk, um, which is sort of a support uh, network, we have students complain about certain things and get upset, and it's kind of like we let the community see that and kind of pick it apart ourselves and with them, so it's good to have open feedback, we found. Um, so yeah, um, in summary, these are the things that we talked about, or I guess I talked about. Uh, <laughs> um, just the importance of showing your stuff to people, even if it's not your target user. Um, and really actually doing that and getting feedback. Um, working with analytics, even if it's not you yourself, finding people in your organization who work with analytics and figuring out a way to get them involved in your work or you get more involved in their work. Um, customers or users, the idea of you know talking with people all throughout your organization that are talking with, uh, with, with your customers and, and being all in sync. And then the three methods, mental models, really trying to understand how do people approach your, your system and how can you work for that or around it. Prototyping on paper, and lastly, you know, setting up continuous mechanisms for feedback. So, yeah, that's all I've got. Any questions? Sure. So for face-to-face -face usability studies, I so I live in San Francisco, um, and if anyone here has heard of a service called TaskRabbit, it's a really great way. Um, I don't know. I, I believe they're in most metropolitan areas, but it's a really great way to sort of post a chore um, and have people go out and bid for it. Um, like normally, it's like. I'll pay you money to get my groceries or to pick up something from the store. So what I do is I'm like, hey, you come to uh, downtown San Francisco for a usability study. And people bid on how much they'd be willing to do that for. And I actually pre-screen them with a, with a survey. And I'm like, to be eligible, please fill out this five question thing. So I have some general background of where they're coming from. Um, Craigslist, at least in San Francisco, works really great. Um, also, <laughs> well, for universities, I used to go to university campuses and literally put up flyers, said, hey, like, come call this number if you want to make $50 and talk to me. <laughs> and also another service I use is called usertesting.com. That's for remote usability studies. But those, Craigslist, just in-person ads, and TaskRabbit are the three main ways I've gotten people. So pretty minimally, at least for um, with TaskRabbit, the questions I was asking for screening were highest level of education, age, um, what they're currently doing, and I think like last institution attended. So really kind of big blocks there. Um, with TaskRabbit, you can get people. You can get people that are just kind of maybe not what you're looking for for very cheap prices, or you can get maybe someone you are looking for for much more expensive. So it really depends on the project, I think. Sorry, I'm just using us because it's easier. Yeah, no, it's, that's the smart thing, yeah. Okay, um, I'm curious to know a little bit more about the marketing personas and the UX personas. Um, we're kind of in the same situation mm -hmm. and so, yeah, maybe you wanna, I'd be interested to learn a little bit more about that and maybe what the difference is between market research and UX research. Yeah, okay, that's a great question. Um, I guess everyone could hear it because it was on a microphone, so I won't repeat it. Um, so in my experience at university now, what ended up happening was that we, we were putting out ads on Google, like Google search ads with words like, you know, uh, almost, almost that felt cheap, that felt like we were selling this idea of being cheap. And then we were talking to users who would never use the word cheap, would never use the word like inexpensive. They were using affordable, or they were using like well-priced, or stuff, stuff, something that just felt better. And kind of then like looking at the ads and hearing what people were saying, sort of what, what, what woke us up to this like huge disparity. Um, in, in between just the, at a language level, how we are talking about ourselves and to other people. 
Um, the marketing world, at least on the internet, uh, can be very run by search engine stuff. Like how do we best use words in a way that search engines will pick up our pages and all this type of stuff, um, which is not people speak. So for us at least, that was a very big, like how, how are we gonna get around this? Um, we ended up, you know, really kind of, I guess using usability studies as a way to put some more color to what you know the marketing team was working on where it was like, well, you know that these keywords will do well, but this is what our customers actually say. And it was just a lot of conversations over and over again. Um, honestly, at this point, we don't really have a dedicated marketing team. It, it is the UX team that handles, um, <laughs> that handles marketing. Um, I think that as, as user experience people, it's really our role to facilitate these discussions coming from like marketing. Like I think market research oftentimes can be more about um, from a larger scale, like how an industry is doing, like what are people buying um, and not as granular about how this individual product that you're doing will be received by people. So kind of countering this kind of the industry says with um, this is what our customers say um, can be useful. But yeah, it's a, it's a tough line and I, I just really think that communication is the absolute, cl communication and collaboration is the key and if, as the UX person to come in and be like, I really value what you do and I wanna work with you so we can like find those people together. The other thing, now that I'm thinking of it, was that I think the marketing team at this point was trying to sell to someone who wasn't really the user that was gonna be successful at our school. If you are a student that's looking for the cheap, fastest way to your degree, like our, our schools are kind of hard. Like you're not gonna, that's not gonna be the answer for you. So making sure from a business perspective, everyone's aligned on what they're trying to do. It's, it's hard, but I think being a facilitator and getting people in the room to talk about these things is kind of how you have to start. And that article that I, that's in the end of this, let me, hold on. That's the, that's the bit.ly link to the slides. And I'll put some more resources at the end of it too. But uh, that article I mentioned, I checked that one out. Sure. Pushback from developers on your UX recommendations and how you deal with that. Pushback from developers on UX recommendations. For sure. Um, and as someone that also does a lot of front end development, um, implementation time and cost and tearing hair outness is certainly something that needs to be grappled with. Um, I think oftentimes, I'm trying to think, there was a specific example once where we were doing a course tour for inside of our courses and the desired functionality was that there was an X button to, it was like a modal window. It was like, let's have an X to get rid of it or you can click outside um, or you can hit escape. And the developer was essentially saying, having the X button will be really complicated. And there are already two ways for them to, to get rid of it. They can click anywhere or they can hit escape. And so the conversation just came about like, well, okay, what if you don't know those two things? Let's think about what kind of user actually knows to hit escape or click out anywhere. Um, how would that feel to be kind of trapped inside this modal window and not be able to escape? Um, I think as UX people, um, appealing to like empathy and emotions and trying to help developers who oftentimes are very receptive, sometimes not, get inside the head of what users feel like um, is what I do. Also, I try and invite people to all the usability studies I do, whether it be in person or remotely, or just publishing all usability reports in a public way for the company um, and trying to get people involved. Sometimes if there's a developer that's particularly kind of not responding to UX results, I will invite them personally to a study and say, hey, like, Sarah, please come and I want you to see what what happens here, just, just come and observe. Um, I think getting people, it's all about getting people involved, getting people to feel like you're not making it up and the numbers help. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, I just had a question about uh, assessment and stuff. Um, so that readiness meter, mm -hmm. is there anything that's replacing that? Yeah, so the readiness meter is still going to be a meter, but it's no longer gonna be the idea of helping you predict when you're ready. It's going to be literally just about progress, like how far have you come. And do you have to justify to the users how that 
score is yeah. calculated, so that's, to speak? That's a great question, and I think that's something that um, my colleagues are trying to figure out right now. We, there definitely needs to be... So it's my view that we definitely need to communicate that there's a change in the way the, the bar is being calculated. Um, and sort of that, that tool tip that I, that I showed is kind of one example of how we're trying to communicate that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a question of how do we um, kind of contextualize that the thing has changed in a way that's not, I guess, totally in your face and makes you freak out. And is that like the kind of the metrics like of how that is all determined? Um, do the teachers get input on that at all, or is that pretty much like is it a, like an auto auto graded system, or is it a summative or formative? Yeah. So the assessment meter itself is actually just it's it's an algorithm. It's really just based off how many things you have completed at this okay. point. It'll be like you've you've done your initial assessment check. You've done quizzes one through four check 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 like that kind of a thing. Um, Instructors and advisors hear a lot of feedback from students who who are having those frustrated quotes. I assume you get pushback. Yeah, the, <laughs> the, the pushback. And so that kind of bubbles up to us and we can you know work from it from there. But it is supposed to be this objective measure of your progress, which has nothing to do with the subjective opinion of your instructor or any human. And one last quick question. Sure. Uh, which is generally more uh, of the more advanced user, the students or the teachers? That's a great question. Okay, who do you think? The students. Exactly, yeah. I mean, we have so many students who are software developers, who are people who like run the internet because these are people who are self-starters, super motivated, know how to manage their time. And to be honest, to be successful in the tech world, you don't always need it, you don't usually need a degree, right? Like you can teach yourself stuff. So we have a lot of students who are super tech savvy, who are literally, like I've had students be like, this is why it's not working in IE7, okay? The box model, let's get on it here. Like, literally, like, people who totally know their stuff. Um, our teachers, I'd say, are more from traditional academia or, in general, from, from online instruction models as well, but are not the type of web savviness that our students are, many and of our students I are. I take it that requires a much more kind of a greatly more simplified UX experience for the teachers more so than the students? Well... This in a teacher, perfect world? <laughs> in, a, in a perfect world, I mean, in a perfect world, teachers would feel like they wouldn't have to even think of the fact that they're using an interface, right? It would just be like a grade book, and they can just do their stuff, and it's all good. But, yeah, teachers have a lot of responsibility, um, and I think our, we have not figured, we have not optimized, like the question before, we haven't optimized the teacher experience yet because we, we're small and we're still trying to figure everything out for the student first, but they are very different experiences, and they, but they are just as much users as our students. So, yeah, thank you. You said that uh, retention was mm -hmm. important, and we all know that taking higher ed is difficult, whether it's online or offline, you said right. it's difficult. Can you just, like, Maybe talk for a brief moment on usability things you did to uh, help people get through that challenge besides just it's easy to use, but were you able to give people a little boost? Yeah, that's, no, that's a great point. And I really think that the, the majority of that, uh, of the success there is really about our academic staff, about our student advisors and our instructors who are interacting with students um, on a very personal level and helping them and coaching them through their degree progress. Um, they are the first line of defense for technical issues, for academic issues, for billing issues. I mean, we have an incredible staff of, of people that you know really guide students along the way. Um, I think, so in our case, I really think that's where the, where the credit is due. Um, in terms of the UX side of things, yeah, I mean, I, I think, in, in, if anything, this, the, this establishing those sort of continuous feedback cycles where we're learning something is a really big pain point, um, and then working to fix it, um, like the readiness meter, I think that's kind of the, you know, that's sort of, that is our role to, to, to fix things when we really hear about people struggling through them. But it's definitely our academics staff that kind of helps students get to where they need to be. Uh, so, so this isn't a UX question, but I, I thought it was kind of 
interesting that your pricing model is a time mm -hmm. based, but courses can be done as quickly as you're ready. Do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, decision? so well, okay, I guess I'll say the slightly more extended version of that. Um, so semesters at, let's pick new charter. So semesters are 16 weeks long. Um, and basically, when you begin a course, you have, you can go as slow or fast as you need within this semester period. Within 16 weeks, if you, you go one after the other, maybe you can complete five courses. Maybe you only complete one. But um, it is a 16-week kind of time-based semester chunk. Um, so we have like a bachelor's degree, which, you know, can take four years. Or if you're coming in with a lot of transfer credits and you're working incredibly hard, I don't know, maybe you get it done in two years. Like in that sense, it's very up to you. But we do have this delimited 16-week block, if that makes sense. Um, and the tuition is monthly or it's annually. Or, no, sorry, monthly or I guess by term, paying up front with that. So yeah, the website's younow.com for the company, uh, new.edu for a new charter, and patent.edu for patent. Another question? Sure. So um, you said like with user voice mm -hmm. that you hash things out with students and staff. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious if you, um, like when you are addressing the students, if it's like the UX team says this, or do you get like personal and say like your first name or like that w in that process? Sure, that's a really great question. Um, so I, I, I wanted to mention that in the context of this email. So this is an email that I wrote um, on behalf of like me, the UX person, to a current student. And in my experience, I've found it very helpful to be very specific about who you are and what your intentions are in having a conversation. I have nothing to do with your grade. I am not a teacher and I can't like help you or hurt you or anything. All I'm concerned about is the experience that you have with our school online. So being very upfront about that and kind of saying my role and, and who I am has, for me, been the most successful. When I started out in the beginning, I don't think I mentioned outright about user experience and I did have some students saying, well, do you know my teacher? Do you know, like, are you gonna be able to, like, how, what are the communication channels like? So in, I, I think as, you know, if you're doing this on behalf of user experience research, it's really helpful to just say that. And it, oftentimes it makes your users potentially, or at least in our case for students, it makes them feel a bit more relaxed and willing to open up. Okay, well, thanks for coming.